In this tutorial, we're going to look at some common questions in the topic of kinetic particle theory. In kinetic particle theory, we learn that the all matter is made up of particles and the particles are in continuous random motion. Another thing that we learn in kinetic particle theory is the concept of diffusion where the particles move from an, a region of higher concentration to lower concentration. So over here, the question describes a phenomenon where we have bromine liquid placed in a silk gas jar and after some time, the color of bromine has spread throughout the jar. So how do we explain this phenomenon or this observation? If you look at the question, it's a three mark question. So we, you are expected to give three or more points. So firstly, we were given bromine liquid. And after that, the color spreads throughout the jar. That is a hint to us that the bromine liquid had been converted or evaporated into a gas or into a vapor. So the first key point would be evaporation of the liquid into a vapor state. Next, even after evaporation, why would it then spread out throughout the jar? That means that diffusion has taken place and diffusion takes place due to the random continuous motion of your particles and diffusion also takes place um, uh, and the reason why it spreads throughout because diffusion takes place from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. Okay, if you are worried about how to phrase or what are the key points that Cambridge is looking out for, we will look at the mark scheme in the next slide. So again, this is a three mark question. So Cambridge only expects any three of the following points. So as mentioned, there was evaporation, there's diffusion, okay, particles moving, continuous random motion, and then there is a movement of particles from higher to lower concentrations. The next very, very common type of question in kinetic particle theory is to ask you to describe the movement and arrangement of particles in a solid, in a liquid, and in a gas. Okay, so the question usually involves a transition uh, of the substance from one state to another, and then you're going to have to describe the change in movement and the change in arrangement. So the very first thing that you need to do in such questions is to identify what is the change in state from what to what. So in this question, the question tells you that the liquid changes to a gas. So we need to write down the two states, liquid and gas. And then we need to recall the descriptors for the movement and arrangement of particles in a liquid. The movement would be slight over one another so the particles slide over one another in a liquid in a gas they move rapidly and in all or in random directions now take note that in the descriptor for the movement of particles in the gas there are two points that you need to state one is the rapid movement the other one is the all directions or random directions. Now we look at the arrangement of particles in a liquid. It is closely packed in a disorderly manner. And then the arrangement of particles in a gas would be very far apart and very disorderly. So once again, when we look at the descriptors for the arrangement of particles in liquid and gases, take note that there are two points and both 
need to be stated in order to get full credit. Okay, so when a liquid changes to a gas, once again the movement changes in the in the following way, the particles. Um, change from sliding over one another to moving rapidly in all directions and the arrangement changes in the following way from closely packed in a disorderly manner to very far apart in a very disorderly manner. This question is very similar to the previous one. So in this question we are looking at solid carbon dioxide changing directly into a gas and in this chapter we learn that this particular transition phase transition is called sublimation carbon dioxide is one of the three substances in our syllabus that we need to know that actually sublimes the other one is solid iodine and the last one is solid ammonium chloride so when you heat these three solids they do not transit to the liquid state but it becomes a gas completely. So this question again requires us to describe the changes in movement and arrangement. So the difference now is the change in state from solid to a gas. We have looked at the movement and arrangement of particles in gases so I'm not going to elaborate on that but for solids the movement would be vibrate about fixed positions. And the arrangement is closely packed in an orderly manner. Okay, so when our solid carbon dioxide changes to a gas, the movement changes from vibrate about fixed positions to moving rapidly in random or all directions and the arrangement of particles changes from closely packed in an orderly manner to very far apart in a very disorderly manner. Another type of question that we will get in kinetic particle theory is on heating and cooling curves, being able to interpret a heating or cooling curve. So in this question, we are given a cooling curve where a pure compound in molten or liquid state is being cooled down to the solid state. So when we look at a heating or cooling curve, the thing to look out for would be the, the particular section where the temperature remains constant. In a heating or cooling curve, when you see that the temperature remains constant, it tells you that during this or in this section or during this time period, the substance is undergoing a change in state. So for this particular change, uh, question is changing from a liquid to a solid. And the next thing that we need to be able to recall is that in each section, what state of matter is the compound in? So since we are changing from liquid or molten to solid, from P and Q, we are looking at the liquid state. From Q and R, it would be a mixture of solid and liquid. And then for R and S, it is pure solid. So the question is asking for when uh, liquid and solid both present, it will be from Q to R. So once again, we are looking at a cooling curve here. When the temperature remains constant, it indicates that there's a change in state for this particular particular question it changes from liquid to solid so we are looking at the process of freezing so in some questions you may be given the temperature over here so this temperature would represent the freezing point which is also the same as your melting point of the compound as mentioned, a key concept in the chapter of kinetic particle theory is that of diffusion and a common or typical question that tests you on the concept of diffusion would be something like this. So whenever you see a long glass tube with two cotton wools at each end, 
uh, we are looking or we are testing you on the concept of diffusion. Now this question, despite being common, is usually very poorly understood by students. So please listen up very, very carefully. So the cotton wool on the left is soaked in hydrobromic acid and the cotton wool on the right is soaked in aqueous ammonia. For the diffusion experiment to start, the acid and the alkali must first evaporate. So your hydrobromic bromic acid will evaporate to form hydrogen bromide gas which will then diffuse to the right and your aqueous ammonia will evaporate to give ammonia gas which will then diffuse to the left. When hydrogen bromide gas meets ammonia gas, a reaction happens. It forms solid ammonium bromide, which is a white solid. So this is actually described in the question. So in the question, it's also mentioned that the solid ammonium bromide appeared at point X, which is closer to hydrobromic acid than equals ammonia. So how do we explain this result? We need to first recall this very important concept involving diffusion, which is that the speed of diffusion is inversely related to the relative molecular mass of the gas. Meaning, the larger the relative molecular mass of the gas, the slower it diffuses. So the next thing that we learn in this chapter is how to compute the relative molecular masses, which is essentially the sum of the atomic masses as represented in the formula of the gas. So hydrogen bromide, HBr, would have a relative molecular mass of 1 plus 80, so 81, and the relative molecular mass of ammonia would be 14 plus 3 times 1, which is 17. So looking at the relative molecular masses of hydrogen bromide and ammonia gas, it's very obvious that ammonia gas will diffuse much faster than hydrogen bromide. So therefore, in the same period of time, ammonia gas would travel a longer distance. Therefore, the solid ammonium bromide would form closer to hydrobromic acid. Once again, how are we going to express that in the keywords? It will be shown in the marking scheme in the next slide. So as mentioned, the ammonia and hydrogen bromide must first evaporate so they have enough energy to escape from the aqueous solutions. But usually um, this is not uh, a key point. But again, it's just any fall from here. So the ammonia gas would, and the hydrogen bromide gases will diffuse then there is a movement from high concentrations to lower concentration. Solid form when your ammonia gas and hydrogen bromide meet. Hydrogen bromide has a higher MR or relative molecular mass than ammonia. So therefore it moves slower or ammonia gas moves faster. And therefore, that explains for the position of the ammonium bromide being found closer to hydrobromic acid. So usually such questions do not carry so many marks. Uh, it could be just only two marks or three marks. So you only need to describe um, the relative molecular masses, the difference in relative molecular masses and how it affects the speed of diffusion. Another very, very typical but scary question related to diffusion is that of a porous pot. So a porous pot question is one where you see 
a diagram looking like this. So how do we interpret this diagram is that we have a container. The walls of the container are porous. Porous meaning gas molecules can enter the container. Gas molecules can come out of the container. Okay, so in a porous pot question, usually there will be two gases, one inside the container, inside the porous pot, and one outside the porous pot. So the gas inside the porous pot is going to diffuse out, and the gas outside the porous pot is going to diffuse in. Now, depending on the relative speed of diffusions or rate of diffusions, after some time, we will end up with either more gas inside the pot or less gas inside the pot. When we have more gas inside the pot, the pressure inside the pot will increase. When we have less gas inside the pot, the pot pressure inside the pot will decrease. So that would cause a corresponding change in the water level in the tube. So in this question, they're asking you which gas when present over the porous pot, that means outside the porous, porous pot, would cause the water level at Y to increase. For the water level at Y to increase, it means that the pressure inside the pot must increase after some time. For the pressure to increase, it means that we have more gas inside the pot, meaning the gas outside must diffuse in faster than the gas inside diffusing out. So for that to happen, it means that the relative molecular mass of the gas, the unknown gas, okay, must be lesser than that of oxygen gas. Now this question is slightly sneaky because the molecular formula of oxygen is not given and they require you to recall that oxygen has a formula of O2 or it exists as a diatomic gas. So the relative molecular mass of oxygen therefore would be 32. So in this case, we need to look for an option where the relative molecular mass of the gas is less than 32 and that would be option C where it is 16. Now in under exam conditions where you cannot Think clearly, you cannot process the entire uh, sequence of thoughts in order to get to the answer. There's a very um, direct cheat code that you can use, which is to evaluate the molar masses, or sorry, to evaluate the relative molecular masses of all the options and then choose the odd one out. Okay, what do I mean by that? If we take a look, Carbon dioxide is 44, chlorine 71, nitrogen dioxide would be 14 plus 32, that would be 44. Okay, so if you look at the relative molecular masses, you will notice that three options have the relative molecular masses larger than that of oxygen, only one is smaller than hydrogen. So the one that is the odd one out has to be the correct answer.